Well, thank you all for joining us. My name is Samantha Corcoran, and this is our Sitting at the Feet of Rabbi Jesus class behind me. Everyone say good morning. Good morning. morning. <laughs> and we are, we are so thrilled to have you with us, Lois. Um, we have loved your book and have had so much excitement every week making new discoveries mm -hmm. and aha moments, and it has really been a lot of fun. And so uh, we've sent you a compilation of questions from the class that we've had along the way. So we're excited to hear uh, your response to some of those questions to help us dig a little deeper. Um, but for this video, we wanted to just have a chat with you and hear a little bit more about uh, what was it like, the, the process to write this book? Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about some of your Israel adventures, and then we can do uh, an open Q&A session at the end. Okay. Okay. Um, so thank you again for joining us today and I'll sit down and I'll let you take it from here, Lois. Wonderful. Good morning, you ladies. Wichita, Kansas. I am in uh, Holland, Michigan in the beautiful basement office in my house where it's a little bit chilly, um, especially when it gets warm and sunny outside you know winter is over and spring has come and i believe today is the first full day of spring but um uh uh, uh i dwell in my little dark office anyhow and and i enjoy it and i'm looking forward to talking with you folks uh this morning so let's see so you you studied my book sitting at the feet of rabbi jesus mm -hmm. and you kind of want to know a little more about me or and how I got to this place, perhaps that's what a lot of people do. Um, yeah. I think you maybe heard that I actually have a PhD in biology, so that sounds a little crazy, but it teaches PH, PhDs make you learn how to do research where you go read things that have a lot of vocabulary in them that you don't understand and learn quickly. <laughs> And then uh, evaluate all these partial sources and push them all together. And that's exactly what you do in any kind of research. And so that's kind of the skill, the nerdy skill that I brought into my Bible study. And especially because, and I think uh, some of you have heard uh, Ray Vanderland. How many of you guys, you guys have done some of those videos at your church? Yes, he, uh, I moved out here in 1995, and uh, Ray uh, teaches at the local Christian high school, and so everybody knows him out here, and he speaks in our churches, and he teaches at the Christian high school, and you can, they actually have the last row set up so that uh, people who want to come sit in the back and listen to him can listen. So a lot of people know him around here, but I was in a big class with him. That was actually the thing that got me very interested back in 1996. And I was a professor at Hope College, and uh, I got fascinated. It took, um, you know, it takes a few years of study, 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 but I'm a nerd. I am not married. I used to have cats. I don't even have cats. I'm just a nerd. I like to study. So I have nerdy girlfriends who like to study along with me. That's what keeps me going. So um, so that gives you a little bit of my background. You're, you're in good company because that's us too. Yeah, uh -huh. that's right. <laughs> Honestly, you know, years ago before we had dishwashers and cars and stuff, life was more busy, less time to study. Now the Lord has given us modern conveniences so that we can study more. <laughs> so that's the deal. So, um, and um, um, so let's see. I can, here, I'll show you one thing. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna give you any commercial messages, but we should just get on to our discussion because I know there's gonna be a lot to discuss. But if you're wondering how did Lois get to where she's at, um, uh, I actually, uh, the Lord, he has his ways. I have an immune system that loves, doesn't know quite when to quit. It decides that I'm sick when I'm not even sick. And so when I was teaching at Hope, uh, when I had a really heavy semester, it would decide that some kind of germs were attacking me when they really weren't. <laughs> and so 
Uh, it's called lupus. And there, I mean, there's I have even other things going on, eh, whatever. But uh, uh, gamzo litova, in Hebrew, that means even this is for the good. The Lord can use what he wants to for the good. And so because of that, I had been fascinated and start, I was teaching in my church. That was part of why I got sick because I was so busy. I was teaching at church and stuff. Actually, I was going to rave analyze series. That was, that was, a, anyhow. Okay. So um, uh, when the door, you know, when God closes a door, he opens a window. I'm giving you a little, one of those trait statements, but yeah, that was kind of it. Um, and I, got to know a businessman. His name is Bruce Okuma and his wife, Mary, and I made, we started a little ministry where we were, I was writing articles. We had, there was this new thing called the internet. And um, I started writing articles and a lot of them we put into this book is called listening to the language of the Bible, hearing it through Jesus' ears. And so that was my first book. So, but then Ann Spangler, she's a, um, she has written many books and she's an excellent writer. And uh, she said, ooh, you know, this is great stuff. Boy, people like this Jewish stuff. Do you want to work on book together? And so she and I worked on uh, my Sitting at the Feet book. And I would do the research and do the pre, pretty much I, I wrote the chapters. And then she'd say, oh, Lois, you write like a professor. You lecture too much. You got to warm it up and tell some stories. And so, and then she would write in some stories and kind of help me warm it up a little bit. And that was how, and she's brilliant and a wonderful writer. And so she's been a great blessing. Um, so anyhow, okay, enough of that. So there you go. That's how I got from there to here. Um, so we shall, shall we talk about the book? Can I start with asking which, what chapter was your favorite? Ooh, what chapter was our favorite? Yeah. So everybody opens their book. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that's true. You got to uh, survey. What was it? Well, Here, my I, yeah, was Stringing ahead. Pearls. Oh, yes. Well, mm -hmm. yes. Yes. Uh -huh. And and the part where you explained how uh, at Jesus' baptism, mm -hmm. how even God hinted at scripture with the three... Yeah. Uh huh. Three. Yeah, that was fantastic. Tiny little references to scripture, and they expect you to know the rest of it. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. Yes. So we have mm -hmm. a lot of thing to catch up on, so we can catch those. Yeah. Pretty. Pretty much. Yeah. That was the biggest convictor of mine. That was a huge take-home message. Is you know what? There's the rest of the Bible that you never read. That's really important really 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 important and you're not really understanding the punchline until you read the plot and you need to know the people to know the plot so that's kind of how that's what got me started really so yep and that's what's helping us too i'm gonna that's pass right. this around you guys pass it around and tell her your favorite chapter and okay and i don't yeah you don't have to make a big deal i was just Anybody i mean just to. throw out a couple words you don't have to tell me every single person every one of you but mm -hmm. just because I know it's going to take too much time, I think. So um, uh, here, I'll, I'll, I'll put back, just because I have a feeling we'll have some, we can do a few questions and we'll want to discuss things. How about that? But I'll tell you, my own, the one that made a, the biggest difference in my own life probably was for the blessing chapter, about blessing yeah, the Lord at all times. Oh, wow. Um, um, did you want to jump in, Gail? Well, that was the um, and chapter certainly that following I liked. the rabbi. I'm yeah. sorry. Oops. The what blessing chapter. That's the one I liked. Okay, there you go. So, okay. mm -hmm. Do you do you have any new blessings you say during the day now? Well, actually, when I wake up, I try to um, remember how they say, um, "Blessed is He, O Lord our God, the King of the Universe," and just kind of go from there. Mm -hmm. And you know, each day is is different. So anyway, I don't know. I just it just helped me think a little differently. Just mm -hmm. like a whole different culture has a way of thinking about stuff. And I'm like, they just seem so much more positive about life mm -hmm. in general. And I'm like, I need to go that way. 
Ah, so. Yeah, right. <laughs> Instead of the first thing you say is to complain about the weather, you, the first is, oh, thank you, Lord, for the weather. And what you gave us, it is good. You know? Yeah. So, so, okay. I mean, uh, Samantha, I mean, you, why don't you tell us what would you like to do next? Shall, shall I answer a few questions that people gave me or what would you like to do? Yeah, why don't we go through some of those questions that okay. I've already sent you and okay. we've already had a couple of questions pop up just this morning. Okay. So we can tackle those towards the end. Okay. 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 Well, let's see. Uh, one of those was about uh, baking. Baking you needed some kind of starter uh, dough, some kind of yeast or mother yeast. And what did they do with it when God said, get rid of all of your leaven? The answer is they got rid of all of their leaven. <laughs> you, I think uh, all of you who went through the pandemic read the instructions for how you start a new one. You throw it away, you start a new one. I mean, um, in more recent times, the tr people, um, nowadays, what they do is they, uh, um, and they put it all in a cabinet and, and they put a piece of tape over the cabinet. Um, and then they, there's at some point, and I think it, this, probably the local synagogue does it, where there's a, they find a Gentile and they pay him five bucks. Or no, the Gentile gives them five bucks. It's like they've bought all of the leaven, so they don't own it anymore. And then at the end of um, the week of unleavened bread, when they're done, um, then they sell it back to them. That's how it works. It's that's how they do. <laughs> Isn't that splitting hairs? Well, I, I half of me would say no. The deal is, is that every every how can I say like okay. When God says, um, do not work on the Sabbath, there's always a borderline, you know, this, well, of course it starts at sunset or sunrise. Well, when is that? Well, there's always this time, there's a line in there and we, sorry, I'm going to pull my science out and math. You know what? Lines are infinitely thin. And we, if you've never thought about it very well, you have to realize there is a way you have to kind of make a line and you have to, there's always going to be a sharp split between permitted and not. And so you have to find a way to deal with that. You just have to define it somewhere and say, okay, this is our way of doing. Um, uh, there's actually a discussion in, um, in the Talmud about, about the weasels <laughs> or the, uh, um, yeah, not my, um, you know, you have to get all of the crumbs and all of the grain and anything out of your house. And, um, but mice will, uh, if they get into your grain stores, they'll carry it around. And they'll make little globs of it other places. When we had a cabin, um, I remember pick, uh, vacuuming and you pick up the, the cushions on the car and there'd be this little blob of, of corn. <laughs> that the mice had brought over it uh, and that's that's you would have had to get rid of it but you can't find it all because of the weasels that's that's the name that's the word that's in the Talmud but I, it was mice whatever and so they're like look you can't can't get rid of every last speck and so the one of the last things they do is they um they're one of the first prayers before they have Passover is they declare all well they they have a little ceremony um i know the one of the local rabbis he goes around and takes 10 cheerios he hides them around his house and then the kids have to find them and then they go and burn the cheerio cheerios out in, in the gutter in the street or on the the charcoal grill and then they pray the prayer where they declare all leaven null and void and like the dust of the earth and you just declare it done and i personally <laughs> love that because i do that with dust in my house okay i declare it null and void <laughs> my dust is gone it is clean enough and that is fine it's very symbolic <laughs> it's good it's a way of coping with there are you can just 
kill yourself with you call it legalism or whatever and that's how they cope with mm-hmm. it and, and i think i respect that you know if you are trying very hard to do exactly what the lord wants you to do you kind of have to come up with stuff and i respect them for trying very hard as opposed to oh oh this is too hard i'm glad i'm saved by grace i think i'll just try not ah, i'll just whatever <laughs> that that when it's something like what we're doing here it doesn't seem like a big deal i wrote a chapter in my next book about uh I, there are a lot of laws about it's called lashan hara uh i'll give you a little pre-taste of my next book it's called walking in the dust of rabbi jesus and one of the chapters there that's the one in that book that changed my life the most and that is about how not to use your tongue things you should not say <laughs> about other people and to other people and those are incredibly important things about that um uh even if something is is true you know you, maybe you're sitting there at church and your worship leaders sing off key and you lean over to your husband and you say man she sings so poorly man i can't stand how she sings um and uh, you know the christian response is like it's true i didn't say anything untrue yes but if it would have been said about you or you know you love your neighbor and if if you love your neighbor you don't want them to talk like that so uh, and there are just enormous amount of ideas and good ideas about what not to say and uh, i have found that the more i read of them the better i get and uh, and i find um when people want to transgress they'll push them so that they're still being negative and cruel and people when people want to serve god they they push them farther so they do less and less of it so there's the border shift because people want to do the best possible so anyhow okay that was plenty see i'm going to talk too long if i um so let's see um okay let's see mm -hmm. okay um well it says what does grafted in mean and um let's see what did you guys say about it when you were together or maybe that was a go ahead oh i think it was was it the verse in corinthians where we were talking about how because we are now adopted we uh, should not be arrogant about that yep i think it's in romans actually oh thank you yes i romans. don't have it right in front of me and so that it talks about us being grafted branches um from in the let's see just a second okay okay yep romans 11 hang on here we go he, he is talking to gentiles and not about not boasting and insulting the jewish people uh and it says you will say branches were broken off that i might be grafted in and the the tree that you're being grafted into is the tree of israel of god's people and so that's the idea of what grafting is about and uh it one thing that you and interestingly my own tree out front of my house has gra is it has rootstock and then the the upper part of the tree is all grafted and occasionally i get these little little shoots out of the rootstock from the original tree and so i take pictures just to show you the difference you know it doesn't change you don't magically turn completely into the other tree when you're grafted in you're still a different co your color branches and you have different traditions and habits and yet you are drawing your life sap from their roots so i mean it's very much a picture of our jewish roots yeah that's a fascinating picture and it kind of ties to another question that was mm -hmm. asked about well how do we as christians work with our jewish neighbors mm -hmm. today 
Yeah. Is our yeah. job to convert them or is our job to, you know, pay respect to them because mm-hmm. there are spiritual ancestors? How do we mm-hmm. navigate this? How do you navigate? Well, that's a hard question. Um, um, let's see. It, it, there's a, I would say it depends on every situation. Every situation is a little different. I have to say that honestly, many, many Jewish people nowadays are, they know that they are Jewish, but they don't have, they aren't terribly religious. They tend, um, a lot of people are. And so you can't necessarily say that they, well, but on the other hand, the people who are very orthodox and very religious, they know their Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, much better than Christians do. But the ones who aren't religious don't. And so there's a big difference between who you're talking to. Um, I mean, I find that um, a lot of fascinating discussions go into it as a Christian asking Jewish people to tell me more about what they have studied or learned or what the, how they understand the Bible themselves. I'm learning a ton. But I'm also, we are t- together studying God's word. Conveniently, the Lord made three quarters of it into the Hebrew Bible, which they, and we read, which we don't know very well. So maybe we could read that together. <laughs> and then um, once we're really good friends, um, uh, the issues will come up about our wonderful Messiah, who I'm totally, entirely convinced he was uh, the king of the Jews, and it's Jesus, but honestly, um, a thing that Christians don't know, it took me a while before I found out. I had been reading all these things, and uh, it, it was a few years after I started reading that actually there has been a lot of hostility between Christians and Jews over the generations, and uh, um, there are, um, of course, the, Honestly, part of the reason why there's more interest now is because of the Holocaust. And Christians saw the incredible destruction of the Jews that went on during World War II and this incredible sense of, oh my goodness, what kind of evil, rotten people are we? (laughs) And what on earth were we thinking? So, um, and uh, when I, like, I, let's see. I went to a synagogue in Grand Rapids where they did a Seder where they invited even Gentiles to come and do it wasn't a real one but you know I was just telling them about it and afterwards we were I was chatting with the ladies and around this area everybody's Dutch Holland Michigan I'm Norwegian I'm the ethnic minority but <laughs> so but the Dutch people they do you always ask so where are you from and so I was chatting with these Jewish ladies so where are you from and uh, to a, one of them, every last one of the people there all had family members murdered in the Holocaust. Every last one of them. They all had. And uh, I had, I can't say that in my life I knew anybody who had somebody in their family who died a violent, you know, who knew somebody who had died a violent, horrible death. All of these people do. And so there, there, I have read one, I don't, I see things warming up now, but I have, remember reading one comment where a guy says, you know, even Jewish people who are non-observant don't go, they do know one thing, Jews do not believe in Jesus. <laughs> and it is a, you have to choose between your people and your heritage well, and that's where you get into the difficult place of messianic, what they call messianic Judaism. And people think, wow, where is, how did that happen? That's actually something that came along in the 60s and 70s, where there are actually a few little groups of people, of Jews, who believe in Jesus. That sounds great. Wow, that's perfect. Well, the thing is, is it sounds so great that lots of Gentiles join in. And in America, um, and many, many, many people who go to Messianic Jewish synagogues are Gentiles. And that 
then it actually appears to the rest of Jews who are somewhat hostile that they are Christians who are just pretending to be Jewish in order to convert the rest of them. And there's a, a sense of falseness because of the, you already know that we're all hostile and we have a lot of problems with these people. And now they're trying to destroy us by assimilating us into their population. So can you feel the, so it's a difficult, but yet I have many good friends who are treading that difficult line and um, are finding ways to um, show their uh, love uh, um, for Jesus. And uh, so that's, it's a tough, I have many friends and I respect them a lot. I am not, oh, I would say one thing is that um, our propensity and what I see among many people is our consumerist feeling is, you know, if I don't like Burger King, I'm going to go to McDonald's. And if I don't like, if my church doesn't teach my Jewish stuff, I'm going to drop out. I'm, that's the reason why Christ, the Gentiles are going over to. And my comment is, you know, 50 years ago, nobody knew this among the Gentiles. Now, a lot of people know this. If 50 years ago, we had no excuse. Or we did have we did have an excuse, but now people actually know this. If you all up and leave your Gentile church in order to, the people who are left won't know it, will they? And so it's almost my fault if I go and leave and join my own little club, where uh, we all know the truth and the rest of the people got left behind. My responsibility is to be a loving member of my church family and to help the rest of my people understand the Jewish context of their Bible better. So, okay, that was a long answer. <laughs> That's very helpful though. Yeah. We, we've talked about that during um, our, our class times. We have several who have close Jewish friends yeah. and are mm -hmm. trying to navigate that too. So your, yeah. your advice about uh, find some mutual um love over the old testament like get them exactly. to tell you their stories like that's really helpful so there's cool. lots of uh, uh, i the i have to say one of my struggles when i first started out it was i think one of my very first questions that i asked to ray was um i say it's like doing math you know i i think they must be using a different logic where you know, where two plus two equals five or something. And so how can I learn, you know, you, he has learned from all of these Jewish scholars. And I said, well, how can that work? You know, they're reading the Bible and they're coming up with the answer that is fundamentally the not answer that I'm going to find. So, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm just saying, how can I learn from their methods if their methods don't get me to the point where I'm trying to go? Like they're giving me directions going that way and I'm trying to go over this. <laughs> and so, um, but what has been surprising to me is, oh, actually, and it does, this is really a comment to people who are, uh, who have done a lot of study is that people really need to read Jewish scholarship on the Hebrew Bible. There is incredibly good stuff that they write and they're much more aware of. Um, they have thousands of years of experience of thinking about it that Christians can learn from. But sometimes they, there was a point, honestly, right after, um, after Jesus and the disciples went out where there was a really strong reaction against. And so there's a lot of silencing that has gone on. And you see that um, they, like they used to read in the synagogue, they used to read the, um, the Torah. Well, they still do. Thousands of years afterwards, they still do it the same way. You read the Torah and the, it's called Haftarah. That's the prophets, the prophetic readings. Um, they started this fairly, not, they had started doing this in the time that Jesus was there. It developed more and more and they had really set readings. But um, you can see that there was a shift 
uh, four or 500 years later, where they went from letting people choose their own readings from the prophets that went with the Torah portion. And usually those readings were quite messianic. They liked to read about God, how God was going to answer all of his promises and how he was going to have a new creation. All these, wow, that's great. I love it. And then they said, no, we're going to choose the readings and we're going to specifically disclude anything that talks about Jesus. And, and so there is definitely, a, there's a shift and it's away from um, thinking about God's wonderful promises to, uh, to redeem the world through, through uh, a Messiah who will die for his people. So, okay. Um, but be that as it may, I would still say Jewish scholars are shockingly excellent. That's kind of my own issue. I'm a little, and there are a lot of Christian scholars who don't have never read them and are are, are really missing out. So it's a little thing on the side there. So, mm -hmm. and if you guys want some sources, we can share that afterwards. If you've got recommendations of what commentaries to look at or specific sure. scholars to read. Oh, sure. Sure. Uh, I think is it Abraham Heschel? <laughs> <laughs> yes, he it's he's good, but he's quite advanced. Um, <laughs> you, he is, uh, when I when I picked his stuff up long ago, when I people will pick it up when they get started and they they think they kind of understand them and they don't. There's so much more going on. He's really way beyond a lot of people. So he's pretty deep. Yeah. He's deep. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, well, so I'll, I'll follow up with you after and maybe yeah. get a couple of sources in case people yeah. are interested in reading. And also our church librarian is in the yeah. audience. Ah, yeah, well, <laughs> good idea. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. great. Yeah, uh, right. let me see. Okay, well, that was helpful. Thank you, Lois. Sure. Um, here, I'll, okay. How did women in Jesus' time fit it all in? To raise kids, study themselves and daily life. <laughs> um, well, the women who you hear walking around, you know, like they want women came down from the galley uh, with, and the ones who, um, let's see, who were like his sponsors who gave money to him, they were wealthy and they had servants, servant girls, and they had daughters and daughters one thing you also hear me hear is that I have gotten to be good friends with a friend if she's from Uganda from Africa and she can explain a lot of old world ways of doing things and one thing is that you know we have our children we send off to school and we don't expect children to do anything except for going to school and when they get home they just run around like little wild people do whatever they want and play video games in Uganda yeah no Kids help around the house from the moment they're old enough to do it. <laughs> Even little teeny weeny children, the first thing they'll teach them is how to run an errand for their mom. And uh, Millie's daughter lives around the corner and their little three-year-old, she'll, I don't know if she quite has done it, but you send the kid, little kids over to pick, get something from the, your neighbor's house or whatever, because the little close knit communities. And so the children help and there are servants that help too, because there are always people poorer than you. And I think even not the, you didn't have to be really wealthy in order to employ servants because there's always people who need some money. And if they can help you, that's what you did. So be rich. Otherwise you're too busy. And that's part of the reason why women generally were not as well studied. Um, um, in Jewish law, they, there's a rule that um, um, they call it time bound commandments. Women are not obligated to keep time bound commandments. And those are ones where at certain times of day, you must go to the synagogue to read, to recite certain prayers because the kids need you. You've got little running, squealing little kiddos running around. You can't do that. And so they said, women are, if I'm, they're released from doing that. 
But of course, that kind of makes that, and they're also released from coming to study. Although in the first century, there, there's, there's actually more freedom of women to come to the synagogue, even when they're having their periods, they can come and they can discuss in kind of the high level discussions. Not a, there are times when, you know, very learned the rabbis, the ones who became the teachers who go from town to town and have kind of extra nerd out sessions with their students, um, uh, the, that uh, people from around town would come and sit in, you know, people like you. And if they had their servants to stir their pots, they would come over and listen and pop up their own answers. And you actually hear women being involved in that. So that's fantastic. I yes. mean, that we have records of yeah. women contributing. Yep. I think, and it, what you actually see is that this right now, there's quite, there's a, in Orthodox synagogues, there's a separation. It's called a mechitza between the men and the women. The women sit by themselves. Sometimes they'll have a balcony and the women have to go up in the balcony. So they're far away from and very kind of set apart from the main thing going on. And uh, that actually didn't really start for a few hundred years. It didn't, the synagogues were not like that back in the first century. Um, there's a scholar who's written about that. And it, they think it actually came from Muslim or Christian influences that, the, that the, all their neighbors were discluding the women. And so why shouldn't you two? So that's, they started doing it later, so. Wow, that's fascinating. Yep. Um, we've seen pictures of the synagogue at Cab Capernaum, mm -hmm. uh, the, the ruins, and you, and you can see the seating all around in the U-shape on the perimeter. Oh, yes, there's, no, right. there's no divider. <laughs> no, exactly. There isn't a divider. You have these, yeah, that's right. You're in the round. You have a bema. Uh, that's a, the same word is for high place in the Old Testament, where you talk about the high places. That's, those are oh. bemot. And so bema is where you have the Torah and people read from the Torah there. So, yep. Okay. Let's see. Um, oh, golly. What are my favorite blessings? Well, the one thing that hits me is that it, the way you phrased it, what are your favorite blessings to say daily? But I think the whole premise of what they're saying is that, is that it's not the day that makes you do them. You know, you get up and now I say things today. It's the, the it's you're responding to the thing in front of you. Like here, you guys all, hopefully, when you sit down to meal, as you sit down and there's all this food in front of you, you put your hands together and you feel, let's pray. It, you're, you train yourself into this reaction of, I see food, going to eat, must praise the Lord and thank him, right? And it's, they are training themselves into a thankful response. When I see an orange and I smell housingy, ah, wow. Blessed art thou, O Lord, or God, king of the universe, who has given a pleasant fragrance to fruits. <laughs> and so every time you see an orange, wow, yay, look what God did, yay. It's like a constant celebration of God's, that's the whole premise behind the whole thing. And, you know, you're welcome to do, come up with more of them, but the more you put them in place, the more it starts to reform how your brain reacts to the world. And so as one of your ladies said, they seem to be much more positive to the world. And that's exactly like what happens when you start doing this. You take in, um, there's a saying, uh, well, actually when the Israelites, when God gave them the commandments, it says, not a say, not a say venishma, and that means we will do and we will shma here or understand. It means uh, I think I said it in this book. I said it more in other books. Sh to hear can mean well, it means obey. To understand, to you know, uh, like they could not shma eat um, during the Tower of Babel. God mixed up their languages so they could not understand each other, okay? And so that saying means we will do and we will understand. And there's a little kind of, it's a little um, preachable 
it's called midrash where they say first you do what god tells you to do and then you learn why he told you to do this and i would say that with the blessings first you start doing these things you're like why are we doing this why don't we have to do this it's just an extra thing i don't want to do an extra thing and then you start noticing wow the more i keep saying this every time i open an orange the more i'm convinced that god has god was right there and he blessed us by giving us this good smell of fruit <laughs> kind of giving you the premise behind them but um i certain ones um well one of them I told you the story in my book about how a good friend of mine at his son's wedding, we were praying for his son. And when he finally got married, it's, it says, blessed is he who has given us life and has sustained, sustained us and brought us to this season. And that's a very, uh, you say that at big feasts, you say it after you've gone on a, like a big journey uh, and through a dangerous place. If you've gone on a on the sea voyage and you're ris risking your life when you get there, you say, oh, thank you, Lord, for giving me life and sustaining me and bringing me to this season. That's called the Shehekianu. And I think that one's a really good one because you're, you're reminded when you're standing, you're like, oh, God, thank you. So it's just a training into thankfulness that I think we all have to have. The more you do it, the more you say things. You heard my uh thing i said at the beginning i said gamzo letova and that means even this is for the good and uh, it's about even when bad things happen god has a good purpose for them it's kind of a blessing when you don't have a blessing that you would say because you're enjoying it <laughs> it's not really a blessing it's a statement of faith in god so it's such a different perspective yeah it's a God-centered perspective. So, no, yep. oh, yes. Okay, Lois, would you kindly spell that blessing that you just said? Okay. Well, and it's not a blessing. What I just said is just a oh. saying, but it's a, and it's gam, G-A-M, gam, zo. Uh, gam means also. Zo means this. Um, Is it le, Z O? Yeah, Z O. And then L L E. And then Tov. T O V. Tov. And uh, he, you know when God made the the world each day, he he declared it Tov. Tov. Oh, good. Right. Even this is for the Tov. Good. And. Actually, uh, here here is a blessing that I really like, and you can use this one if you don't know other ones. And it's, blessed is he who is good and gives good things. That's a really good one. I, I think you can use that at lots of places, and I, I think it's a great one. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will say that again. Oh, would you repeat that one more time? Blessed Which, is he who gives who is good, good things. Oh, who no. is good. Uh, blessed is he who is good and gives good things. Excellent. We have a lot of good note takers in here. Okay. Writing that down. <laughs> and you know, in the back, um, for those of, I don't know if, uh, if some of you went and got the ebook version, you know what? You're missing about 30 pages of the most important stuff, I think. Maybe they have it in the back, but there's 30 pages of appendices with a whole big list of blessings in the back. If you read it on ebook, I don't think that they give you that. Maybe they do, I'm not sure. That's why it's good to buy the book and not just get an ebook. <laughs> I don't I shouldn't be saying that. It might actually be there. I don't know. But there is a I have a lovely appendix full of blessings that is I think here just a second. Got to check that. I think so. Yeah. Do you have a, a page number? It's on page uh, 242, 242 from 242 okay. to 244. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I take it back if you actually have it in your ebook version, but uh, it, it there is, but I can at least tell you that in the printed version, there's a black, there's blessings, there's a big glossary of lots of words, there are dates for upcoming feasts. 
and um, lots of charts and there is a simple Seder celebration for celebrating Passover. Oh, we're doing that on April so, 1st. There you actually. go. And a long list of recommended resources. So, Samantha, Perfect. you were asking me about what next to read, and I got a whole big long list there. So that's okay. um, big, Good. like I said, 30 more pages that you're not seeing if you're only, if you just read it, listen to it. Uh, definitely audio versions don't have any of that. Mm -hmm. You're really, uh, as much as I like listening to stuff while I'm outside and don't want to actually deal with having a book that I have to store somewhere, boy, are you missing a lot of stuff that you could have. <laughs> So hint, 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 book authors, we, we need to eat too. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't, I'm not, I don't I, care I that think much. Most I'm of us in here have the book with the study guide, the new you do. Okay, good so, for you. So we're and good, this, we're good. This, and the first version actually, um, here, I'll show you history now, I shouldn't be. This is the old worn out, this is the hardcover version. This one doesn't have... Uh, uh, I can you I can give, send you the file if you want it if you have the old version. But this one, see that little thing? That's that says okay. new version has lots more stuff in it, and that's why I'm, that's why. So, okay, so okay, why don't we open it up? I know that we're running yeah. uh, through our time quickly, so okay, we are. Why don't we can ask her, unless Samantha? What do you see on your list of? Boy, I wish it, she could talk about those things, or you. <sighs> You do. You choose. Well, there's there's one more question we haven't really talked about. Okay. Um, what are the most important points to pass on to our children, grandchildren, extended family from Jewish tradition mm. uh, to help to help bolster our Christian faith? Like, what are the most important things you would pass <laughs> on to your family? What should we do? Um, uh, well. Um, hmm. I'm thinking here, I'll give you one that, okay, and I'm a single person, so I, I'm not really a very good cook. I don't really like cooking. So a lot of people say, so do you celebrate the feast, Lois? Ironically, you know, you think of the word feast. How does a person make a feast for one person? Feasts are not individualistic things where I do my piety all by myself. Piety assumes a group. And of course, you ladies probably have families. I do have a family, but it's dispersed all over. I'm still very close to my sisters. I have a big, I'm the last of seven children. So there's a lot of people I know, but they're all over the planet. We have been dispersed. Um, that's actually, uh, and so... Um, uh, the, the tradition of, you know, if, let's see, the way observant Jews do it right now is that Friday evening, you have a lovely dinner with your family. Uh, and when the sun goes down in the, in the summertime, it can get really late, but you can make it earlier for small children. But, and then you are obligated to talk about Torah, at least at some point. You can't just talk about anything else. And you especially cannot talk Lashan Hara. Use your evil tongues to speak evil things to other people. And you need to talk about Torah. A meal without Torah is like worshiping at the altars of the dead. <laughs> but a meal with Torah, meaning the scriptures and all of God's teaching, because Torah means teaching, is like eating with the in the presence of the Shekinah, the Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus saying, where two or three are gathered, there I will be with you. And so that I think is powerful and valuable and it teaches all of your children around what you feel is very important. If um, uh, one, um, I think I've, I've got in one of those little insets, it says, if you want your children to study your Bi their Bibles, you need to study your Bible in their presence so that they see you studying. 
If you just tell them to, they won't study their Bibles. They will just tell their children to. Mm. Right? I, I, I have I've spoken with and you know, in my own background, I'm a Lutheran background. I remember I spoke to a Lutheran group. And the ladies were just like you guys. They're like, we love our Bibles. We love to study. We have so much fun together. But we don't know how to deal with our children who don't, you know, they don't seem to be <laughs> as interested as us. And they say, yeah. yeah, because you did your quiet time and you didn't do it around your children. And so your children never saw how cool and rich and wonderful it was. But of course, they'll annoy you and get in your way and want to. But <laughs> in Africa, they're very much more strict with their children than we are. Uh, I'm not going to go there. You guys just hash that one out. People with families can go there. But children sit very quietly when parents tell them to because parents are really tough on their kids when they're not obedient. <laughs> Sorry, I'm telling you too many things. Um, that has nothing to do with Jewish culture. I just know that that is the way it has been in much of the world. Uh, okay. Yeah. Other well, Jewish... Lois, there, there was an article out this week. Um, yeah. I want to say it was the Center for Hebraic Thought, maybe. And yeah. they were talking about how our individual devotional time isn't yeah. doing anybody any good mm -hmm. because we really need to be in small groups like yeah. the mm -hmm. Haverim and right. studying mm -hmm. together and grappling together, not yeah. just by ourselves. That's very good. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I, I have kind of here, this is Tevya. On the one hand, on the other <laughs> hand, <laughs> uh, you guys, uh, when you were preparing, you had to do your reading and then probably you needed a little bit of quiet time in order to concentrate well enough to prepare to do your study to get together. So you need some quiet time to do that. But reading little devotionals that are kind of set free from any biblical context is kind of a useless activity. <laughs> um, you know, certainly there has to be prayer as part of it too. And as I just said, you need to do it in front of your family, which does mean that you have to incorporate children too. And maybe not just run around like little crazy people or read, play video games, but actually teach them how to behave. <laughs> I'm sorry. You can tell I'm a non-parent. Can't you tell? It's terrible. <laughs> it's right? okay. Uh, it's, I, I suppose we should say, may his memory be for a blessing. Because didn't he just pass away? That <laughs> actor that played, when you said on the one hand. Tevya, yes, that's right. Tevya, that's right. Um, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't remember his name right offhand. But yes, and I should not be so terrible. But, you know, honestly, that's part of the reason why women have been quite a bit discluded from study is somebody has to watch the kids. Well, there is serious and difficult high level study. And so I see this even among my friends who are um, very fine scholars. I know women who are very wonderful through graduate school. They are in doing their PhD, but when, and their husband is too, but um, when they sit down to have a big group of Havarim over to have a good discussion. Somebody has to watch the kids and guess who tends to be it? The woman. And so the women, um, God says he'll repay. He will repay those who sacrifice for his sake. And I think the Lord will repay them in heaven. They'll get to catch up when they're there. In the world to come. Nice. We'll, we'll get caught up eventually. That's right. We got eternity to catch up. Very true. <laughs> well, I think that covers most of our questions that were submitted ahead of time. Good. Um, do we have on the spot questions that anybody would like to ask? I'll, I'll come around. Oh, we've got our first one. Jeanette, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so my question is, what makes something kosher? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if that's silly, but... <laughs> Okay, um, <laughs> well, um, nowadays it has to be declared so by a rabbi who has shmika authority. And um, so there are many, many rabbis who go to food plants and declare food kosher. 
um, and you see a little box that will have a like your jello will have a little circle and like a u in the circle that's because it has been declared kosher and uh, with certain things and i think it probably even that it's been prayed for even um when i was on when i took my first plane flights to israel there was a little when they gave out bread they gave you a little slip of paper with the rope with the when they gave out little rolls for Shabbat, I don't think it was Shabbat, it was just rolls, but it said the blessing for the bread is blessed is he who brings forth bread from the earth. Or, you was know, it different Hebrew. before, like in What's Jesus' that? time? Was it different before, like, you know, in Jesus' time? Well, you know? I would say that the, sh the it's very likely that it, it's super short. Blessed is he who brings forth bread from the earth. Um, and then the longer version, blessed art thou, o Lord or God, king of the universe, comma, who brings forth bread from the earth. That came along a few hundred years later. That's So it's always just been a blessing. It's not about how you treat the animals or how you prepare them or anything. Oh, like well, that. yeah, actually that too. Sorry, sorry. I totally forgot about that. Um, uh, theoretically, um, like kosher meat um, has to be slaughtered. Uh, the the animal has to be slaughtered by a, sh let's see, shochet that, um, that we're, who, we're, he has to inspect his knife, that there are no nicks in it, um, that it's a, a sharp cut that causes the minimum amount of pain. Mm. In theory, that's how it should be done. In practice, that has not always been the um, just the, there are, you know, in factories, uh, but animal rights people have tried to help make it a better way. So, but, but the, according to the Torah, you are supposed to cause the minimum amount of pain to the animal. Okay. So, okay. because there are actually quite a few laws in the Torah that are surprisingly distinctive that are about not causing suffering to animals. And so, you know, um, Jesus actually alludes to them, you know, that if a donkey falls into a well, you pull it out. If you're even on Shabbat, it might take you a lot of work, but you do it to prevent suffering to animals. And if, if you would prevent suffering to animals, how much more would you present, prevent suffering to humans? Um, like you, you, you keep your animals tied up on Shabbat, because otherwise you would be tempted to get them out and make them plow your fields for you. Because, hey, everybody wants to make more money and got to get out there, plow your fields, especially when the harvest has come in. Oh my goodness, the harvest is not going to die. Woo, got to get the animals out there. You have to um, get your, um, and so you keep them tied up. But the animals, uh, you need to bring them water. And, you know, you need to, uh, and so you unbind them in order to, whatever. If you need to, you do things so that they do not suffer over Shabbat. You don't make them sit there and suffer a whole day just because you can't unbind them. In the same way, the lady who has been bound for 18 years by her affliction, he sets her free. Because if an animal, and so he's using, when Jesus logics about what is possible, he's actually talking about the Torah. Paul, he says, you know, do not muzzle an ox while he treads out the grain, is about being kind and just to the ox that's doing the work for you. And he says, how much more should humans, you should pay the people who work, do the work to bring you things. So, uh, but they often are, Jesus and Paul are often talking about their Torah. They kind of expect their audience to know that. And that means that we need to know our scriptures a little better. And so if you're, uh, Sam says, what should we learn? Learns we need to learn our, the rest of our Bibles, not just our New Testaments. It may help make Paul make more sense. That's right. That's right. <laughs> he, won't, he won't be so hard to understand. <laughs> he, Paul okay. has lots of, Another he says question. a lot of things and he's working straight out of his scriptures. Yep. Any other any other questions in the audience that we want to ask Lois? Oh well, yes. Oh, yeah. I do want to ask. 
Okay, you ask me. Is the next book ready? Walking in the dark. Is it out ready? Yeah, yes. Well, the what? Yeah, this one's been out for a while. Yeah, here showed it. Mm -hmm. There, walking in the dust of Rabbi Jesus. Okay. So we. <laughs> they want to cover that this next fall in our Tuesday do morning that. class. And then when you're tired of that, I mean, this one is this one has the most applicable things about how to be a better disciple, but uh, and things that make you think more as a loving person which is a really good thing there's one about judging favorably that's one of my other favorite ones when you get there there's a chapter it's called taking your thumb off the scale i'll let you read about that <laughs> but you'll see why it's a pretty big important good thing to learn and that one jesus was talking about he has a little different angle than but Jesus is the wisdom of Jesus' words and the incredible, his understanding is much more, makes a lot more sense when you know the Jewish ways of thinking about it. And so I find the more I study with Jews, the more I understand Jesus. So, and okay, if you once you get done with that one, I've also get this one more, reading the Bible with Rabbi Jesus. And this one actually is another step up. It, it's what I say is, it's it's about how the Bible thinks, and things Westerners don't get big big picture ideas like the the key. Uh, there's one chapter called Greek brain, Hebrew brain, how we think very differently, so we just don't think like the way they do. So there's lots of big picture important things that we need to know in order to understand our Bibles better. Okay. What I like about that particular book is mm -hmm. uh, you really explain how in in our Western cultures, we are very direct in what we mm -hmm. say, yeah. but then the Eastern cultures are very poetic and their language is very flowery and beats around the bush. And, <laughs> and so that one's really helpful to understand Jesus too, for That's sure. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Okay, well. Since we can only do one book at a time, we'll start with we'll start with walking in the dust this That's fall. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Sounds great. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So if you don't have that book, I'd recommend going to her website and we can send that link out. Ourrabbijesus.com. Yep. Uh, on the books page. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um yep. okay. Any final thoughts? You don't have to ask a question, but are there any final thoughts? Like, how has this book changed your Bible study or your views on life? Anything you guys want to share? I think someone mentioned earlier mm -hmm. that it really has changed the way I pray. It just mm -hmm. makes Good. me think and speak. Yeah, I just feel more like I'm speaking to the Father. Mm -hmm. did you catch mm -hmm. that Lois yeah I think so one thing that really uh, what I just heard you, you said when you're praying to your father I I noticed that a lot of people there are so hostile towards their father in heaven and so they'll pray everything to Jesus and uh, I find that Jesus himself he tells his disciples our father pray to our father and so i have found that one major important thing is to start seeing the the heart of christ overlapping with the heart of his loving father if anything i find his father you know you when i sit and read the gospels jesus has a lot of stuff, tough things to say <laughs> i find reading the hebrew bible is almost like i like god better <laughs> i don't mean it that way but jesus has hard things to say and it's hard to sometimes hear all the hard things he says too so um that would that'd be one another thing is that we need to integrate the way we understand the father and the son together that would be if it and i think i say it in my next book is that if um if if your vision splits those your your eyeballs you're not reading your bible with 
both eyeballs <laughs> looking in, reading the, you know, you need, um, now I'm being a biologist, here's your physiology, you know, that you have two eyes that work in stereo with each other and they allow you to see in depth, right? The way it works is that one kind of controls the perspective and says, okay, this is exactly where things are. And then the other one gives you the depth. If you don't have both of them, you can't see the depth. And I, I tell a story about this lady who, uh, she, she had some vision problems with her eyes and she would just go shifting back and forth from one to the other, one to the other all the time. And she never saw things in three dimensions. She went to a therapist, she was working with a, and then there was all of a sudden one day, everything popped out. And so she got in her car, it's like, whoa, the steering wheel is way here. And then she's eating her salad and she picks it up and like, the grape is right. Whoa, the, the three, okay, you're saying, why is this important? Because that's what happens when you start reading the Bible in three dimensions is that you're seeing the depth of when Jesus says this, he's speaking through the prophets and the Torah, and he's reaching way back there, back in the ancient history of time, and you're seeing the whole thing integrate together. It's not just one little slice of the New Testament all by itself. It's the whole thing that builds together, and his loving father is there all the time. Boy, that's a great visual. Seeing the Bible in 3D. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 People use the, um, and when we talk about the feasts, I think the analogy that we use there is that, you know, when you go to Hawaii and all of these mountains, you know, these, all the little islands are separated. But then when you start reading them in light of the biblical story behind them, you find out that it's a one big chain that is all connected in its roots under the water all together and it's the same way as that when you start seeing all these stories you have to go kind of get your scuba diver goggles on and you go back and and then you get to see how it all connects together and you see how tall because like Mauna Kea is the tallest mountain in the world bigger than Mount Everest because of but you can't know that unless you go down into the water and that's what I do is I take people down to see the rest of their Bibles. Well, thank you for being such a great scuba instructor. <laughs> <laughs> We've gotten to see all the coral and the colorful fish. Right. And Little fishies and stuff. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This has been so much fun. I think our, our time is drawing near and I think most of our questions have been answered. It sounds like. Thank you again, Lois, so much for taking time to meet with us and just talk through our questions about the book and what we do next. <laughs> wonderful. Yay. Wonderful. Sounds good. Sounds good to me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you ladies. So maybe I'll sign off and let you ladies have some discussion time to yourselves. How about that? We will. We will. Thank you so much, Lois. And we're going to get ready to jump right into your next book in the fall.